what is the difference with uh, with new bands trying to break into the scene, trying to get on labels? What is the difference between when you were starting out versus now? How, how is it different? How is it harder or how is it easier? Well, yeah, the, I mean, it's 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 interesting because it's it's some of it's the same just like it used to be but it, the parameters are a lot more a lot different now because it's still if we see a band and we really like them we're going to sign and that hasn't changed in 41 years that we've been doing this but you, there are different parameters i mean you would like a band to have some something going uh because that is a really big help for us like if there's you know if you guys have a social media platform or you're really big in your own town or you know, you've got an international buzz, whatever it is, that sort of stuff. It doesn't mean that we would sign a band just because they have a big buzz. There's a lot of bands that I've seen that have, you know, tons of social media and Spotify members, but it's not our, our, our style. But there are other bands that, that don't, like we signed a band called Disagoth, who I love, and from Salt Lake City, and they like literally have nothing happening. They're awesome. But they're so amazing, exactly. But it, it does help, and, you know, we, we do because there's so many bands out there now there's so many good bands i think there's more good bands now than i've ever seen before you know, we can't sign everything so you have to look at that and go like, okay there's these five bands that are all really really good really 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 like we can probably only sign two of them and that's where well you know they've got stuff going on so so that's a big help all right other questions for anybody on the panel by the way so not just for don't be shy uh diana you have a question <laughs> So if you, if you haven't if you haven't heard what she said, he asked she asked Brian what would he be doing if Metal Blade hadn't happened. Well, well I was so in school I, I was uh, really good in English and I, I was uh, creative writing and stuff. So I, I was doing I did the first ever U.S. Heavy Metal Fancy. Uh, I was writing for Krang. I was writing for Sound. So I, I was doing journalistic stuff. So I, I that's where I thought I was headed. And then this record label thing kind of got in the way. So I, I, I would hope that I would have been able to stay in the business somehow, uh, but more than likely probably doing doing uh, journal stuff, hopefully. Because that's really the only skill I have. Otherwise, I don't know I could do anything else. Anybody else? Questions? Go ahead, right there, sir, in the gray shirt. Yeah, John, I, I, I want to ask him something, but I want to tell you something first. Um, uh -oh. No, no. <laughs> Let it go. What are you uh, owing oh, nice. about, dude? <laughs> no, I wanted to compliment you uh, a couple weeks ago on your uh, uh, that rock show, on your um, pick and stranglehold is number one. Love oh, it. the Ted Nugent songs, yeah. From yeah, the, and you did a, and you did Achilles Last Stand. You put Victim of Jane. I was just like. Very oh, thanks. Good. For the people who don't know, myself, Eddie Trunk, and Jim Florentine used to do a show called That Metal Show, and now we're doing a show on YouTube called That Rocks. That so rocks. That's, that's what he's referring to right. every Wednesday night. So if you haven't checked it out, please do. Thank you. Sure. Now you can yeah. ask a question. <laughs> now, Brian, I just want to know, okay, so I grew up with James. I'm from Downey, okay? Um, what, what, what was the deal when you first met him? You met him at the country club at Michael Shanker, was it? No, so the story no? is... So, so the, the, oh, that's, the, how I, that's how I heard it. Cl you're close. You're oh, close. I'm close. So no, it was Lars, actually, at the Michael Shanker show. At the oh, not James Shanker. was there, but none of us, he didn't know Lars or anything. So the famous story was Lars was wearing a Saxon European t-shirt. My buddy John Cornarens, who helped start the fanzine and helped with the Metal Mask for one, we were both at the show, and he was in the parking lot afterwards and saw this kid with this Saxon European t-shirt. This is December 1980. No one in LA knew who Saxon was, let alone had a Saxon European t-shirt. So he runs up to this kid, he goes, you know who Saxon is? And he goes, yeah, you know who Saxon is? And he's like, yeah, so basically that was Lars. He just moved here from Denmark. Right. And you know they started talking, and we're both in the same thing. And then two days later, I can't remember if Lars was at my house, or I was at his house. And, we just all became really good friends because we were all, I was 18 and uh, Lars was 16, we we're all just big fans of the New Wave of Heavy Metal. And I think for him, you know, moving from Denmark over, he didn't know anybody, didn't, he didn't ever expect that anybody would be into the music he was into. So we, we bonded over that. I, don't, I didn't meet James until after Metallica had, had existed, that they put the song on the Metal Massacre. But I remember the first couple times I met him, I might even talk about it in the book, I don't think he said more than two words. <laughs> like he was so shy. So extremely, shy. Is that why you extremely just shy. Metallica? Yeah, first Metal Massacre. <laughs> well, no, the, that, he the reason, to nobody. Yeah, he was so shy. At the first that's couple true. times, he barely said anything. And then he, 
he obviously became more and more social and I've become very, very good friends with him. That's an amazing person. But the, the Metallica thing is, so they brought the tape for that song at the, literally the last second. Like John and I were waiting for Lars to show up with his tape because it, it was like three o'clock and I think we're, we're mastering the whole thing and it had to be done by like five. And if he didn't get there, they weren't gonna be on the album because that was like, and I hadn't heard anything. I didn't know what they're doing. So my friend was starting a band. So yeah, whatever. I need bands. So they got there at the very end, and he gave me the tape, which we had to bump up to a real to real tape. It's all another story. Uh, and he gave me the credits. So back in those days, you had to get a typesetter. For those that don't know, Google it. You'll see. But some somebody has to set all the type for the back of the album. And this we we didn't see the. Uh, prints or proofs or any of that stuff, it just kind of came out the way it was. And his writing wasn't very great, hence the McGovney misspelling as well, and Ron McGovney. <laughs> uh, and I think that the typesetter thought that there were two, Metallica wasn't a word, so I think she thought there were two T's in there, so there were probably two T's. But that was one of the most horrifying things in my entire life. I get this record, like the biggest high of all, I got this, this record, there's like 2,500 I'm sitting in the record store I worked at, and I open the box and I look at it, I go, Oh no, this is not good. By the way, Ron Magoonie should have been way bigger. Uh, anybody else? Questions? Somebody else in the back? All the way in the back, the guy in the top hat. How you guys doing there? Congratulations, John, and, and congratulations, Brian. And a uh, real quick question. I just, uh, Neil Turbin with the Metal Voice, just wanted to ask you, back in the 80s, you know, when you were, of course, doing the Metal Massacre albums, uh, and you worked with Metallica already, did you ever have a, a, I know you were friends with John and Marsha Zazula, Johnny and Marsha Z, so did you ever have a band that you guys were, um, I guess, doing a tug of war over? In other words, you loved them and they loved them and you're, I don't know if it's a bidding war or, or something like that. Yeah, I, I'm sure that, by the way, Neil is, uh, to out him, was the uh, singer on the very first Anthrax right by the way. Um, and he's playing down the street later, too. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I'm pretty sure there was, but what's interesting about the early days is that, you know, I talked to people a lot about, you know, what was happening, and, you know, why bands would sign to Megaforce, why bands would sign to Metal Blade, and, you know, Megaforce was basically signing bands in the New York area and, and also in Europe, and then you know, we were signing basically bands in Southern California, because if a band from New York would sign with us, this is back in the day, there's no fast sheets and no internet or nothing. So to communicate, you have to call. Like long distance calls in, 19, in the early 80s were not cheap. Like you talk for you know, 40 minutes on the phone, it's probably like $120 or something. So bands just tend to stay there. Like we, I, I was good friends with Kurt Vanderhoof from Metal Church, and we talked about signing them, but they ended up signing with a, a label in Seattle for the same reasons. Like, hey, I can you know, drive 15 minutes to the label and talk to you as opposed to, to calling them. But I think as, as both um, you know, both labels kind of kind of grew up, you know, us and Megaforce, there were definitely times that I'm sure we had had some bidding wars and stuff. Not not that often though, because of the, the geographical thing. And I can't think of anything off the top of my head where we really would would fight over. Look, I was I much would have rather had Merciful Fate, but they got to them first, uh, which is great. But yeah, I don't I don't think there was it, it wasn't a whole lot of. Uh, I guess we're competing more or less, but there wasn't a whole lot of competition back there because none of us had really a lot of money. So it wasn't like, you know, we were, we were bidding on stuff. But I think probably towards the, you know, mid 80s, there might have been a couple of bands that we might have like all been bidding on at the same time. There was also Com Member Combat Records, Mike Barney. Combat. Yeah, oh, Mike Barney was Shrapnel. I just, shrapnel. Saw, I, I just saw Mike uh, in Vegas like a week ago. He's doing very well. Um, yeah, Shrapnel. No, because see, the thing with, with Varney was that he was signing mostly the Guitar Hero guys. And that yeah, wasn't Marty really. Friedman, yeah, and Ingle, Ingle, all that stuff. Exactly. He wasn't really my scene as, as much. So we didn't compete, rarely compete with anything. Um, combat for sure, because they were. Who ran Combat? Oh, gosh. Conducting my own interview. They had a, yeah, they had a, trying to, there was a couple people that ran, I mean, Combat became our distributor now, which is, Mike Schnapp. Schnapp was there for a while, but there was a guy before him, Steve that, Sinclair, Steve Sinclair, thank you, yeah, he ran it for a while, so there was definitely, we, we definitely had some tug, tug of wars over a lot of things, Megadeth was, was one of them as well, I think. Wasn't there one with Z, like, about John Zula from Megaforce? Yes. Yeah, Johnny Z, that's who he's just talking about, it's Johnny Z. Johnny, as a part of the scene. And Megaforce. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, are you falling asleep? <laughs> 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 I'm 
Oh, I don't know what's going on. Uh, other questions? Don't be shy. Okay. 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 So, oh, I'll come back. I got to put that down. Is there one that just got to get the market? Well, yeah, I mean, honestly. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> we, we did, look, we did, uh, we were Warner Brothers, they were nice enough to allow us to reissue some stuff on CD that they hadn't got to yet. That was kind of part of the deal. So we did three Alice Cooper records, three Deep Purple records, and five Thin Lizzy records. And Thin Lizzy probably, next Iron Maiden, is my favorite band of all time. So being able to reissue those were, were great. And I was in this, we remastered all of them too. And the great Eddie Schreier, who mastered a million amazing albums was our guy, and we would go in there and remaster these things. And uh, one of the crazy stories about the Thin Lizard, we were doing um, Black Rose, and you know, this is real, real tape stuff, and we're doing it, and I look over, and the tape is like falling apart. So I start freaking out, because like, these are the master tapes, I like got them out of the Warner Brothers library, if this thing breaks, they're gonna kill, I'm in big trouble. So he just kinda laughs, said, no, this is, you, you just bake the tapes, you put them in an oven and bake them. And that fixes it, so wow. so we fixed it. But the Cooper stuff was really fun. Um, and by the way, if you guys are ever in Vegas, we have a Metal Blade Museum out there. It opens every Saturday, uh, starting I think mid August. It'll be open every Saturday. And one of the coolest things in there is when we did the three Alice Cooper records, we were trying to you know, we were redoing everything on CD, and we were trying to you know add stuff to it. There wasn't a lot to it. But I asked Alice if he would you know, like handwrite like just a couple paragraphs about each record. So, which he very nicely did, and uh, we've got the original originals in the museum. That was kind of cool. So, but that was a lot of fun working with, with Alice. Alice. All right, question over here. Yep. Yeah, Shannon. Uh, yeah. Hey, I'm Oka from Flight PR, and I think one of the first times maybe Brian was actually with Fred's Community Ones in uh, Germany. Like doppelganger. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, that was my question because I was going to say, well, for a month I used to come around to see you guys about wine and obsess. Oh yeah, so yeah. so Gott Skuneman is uh, was one of the head writers for Rock Hard Magazine, which is one of the, the biggest metal magazines in all of Germany. And we look very similar, glass is the whole thing, especially when I weighed about 50 pounds more. Um, and I would go to these festivals in Germany, and people come up to me and start, start speaking in German. I don't won't speak German, I go, no, you're not Gott Skuneman? I go, no, this should have to be all the time. So I tell Gott's that, and he, he laughed. And then he would come here for shows in the U.S. and people go up to him thinking that he was so it was a whole thing. In fact, we did. I think it was like Metal uh, um, Rock Hard was doing. Uh, they're doing these video things for a while, like these DVD video things. I think they did like a whole little thing where he he played me and I played him or something funny like that. So no, that's a true story. That happened to me. I don't. I countless times people come up to me and talk to me in German. I go, uh, and I, eventually when they did that, I go, I'm not guys. <laughs> if you don't hear it, there was some cool German shit that was going on. Um, but yeah, that's somebody said you should, that's a good t shirt on my guts. Yeah, I, should, well, I wish I would have bought that. Um, all right, right down here in the front. You could even use the mic. Hey Brian, um, something she mentioned actually made me think of a question. I didn't really have one, but um, as far as the you know the Metal Massacre series, like obviously a lot of those were used to showcase bands, and then those bands would sometimes go on to do a full length with you. The excess were on one of the Metal Massacres, you know, did a full length with them. How would you decide which bands that were on there may graduate to doing a, a full length with you? Yeah, there are a lot of factors for that. I think with the excess, and I love that battle that they're great. They had a deal at the time, so we kind of were able to to pull them to just to, to get a song. But a lot of a lot of times the bands already had deals, but we were like you know Metal Church, as I mentioned before, and you know Overkill. There are a lot of bands that either had deals or were about to sign deals, but we it was a good vehicle for them to be on and get some some extra publicity. And I loved all those bands. So uh, other than that, it was it, it, I don't know that there was a real specific. Uh, the reason why we did some or, or some some other ones. I mean, we liked all. I wish I could have done all of them, but it's just physically not possible. So we kind of picked and choose. It just depended on a lot of different circumstances, like where you know where the bands were, if they had you know management, the same stuff, they had management. We knew who they were, all that sort of stuff. So, but Seth, by the way, great guys. Yeah. Hey, Brian. Um, I'm a fan of Metal Blade. Um, I'm a fan of Metal Blade. Um, I'm a fan of Metal
Um, so Betsy, I want to go down the line. Betsy, talk about where can people find out information on your band? John, I want you to talk about what's going on with Armored Saint these days. And then uh, I think we'll be close to wrapping it up. Okay, well, I'm pretty old school, so I post everything on Facebook. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you guys have had your fair share of selfies. <laughs> Um, everything that we do, I, I do post on Facebook, and we all promote it. It gets promoted on, you know, Instagram and Twitter and you know all the the social media. I do have a, a kick-ass band, two of which are here today: Chris Cardenas, my guitar player, and Kurt Remington, my bass player. My drummer is in Orange County playing cover songs tonight, Scandal West. Uh, but we, um, you know, it's anywhere you want to look on social media. You know, you'll see, you know. The, the shows that we have booked. We have so, uh, some cool ones coming up. We actually have a really kick-ass metal show coming up on November 4th with Hyrax, The Mentors, um, wow. Beowulf, uh, Dissension. Uh, that's that's Saturday the 4th out in Long Beach, a place called Supply and Demand. And, um, you know, just like I said, just, you know, Facebook, that's where I promote everything. And, uh, uh, we're writing some new material, uh, we're playing some gigs, you know, we're still alive and kicking ass. Thank you, good night. I'm kind of a weird guy in the sense that I have absolutely no social media. I'm zero. I'm less of a chagrin, I'm sure, of, of a lot of people in my record company. Your life is so much better. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, I just, that's the way it is, and people on the label are like, dude, come on. Old school, I got it. But in any case, uh, he's got a MySpace. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I did exactly. I even share. I don't even have my proper email. So, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, what, what's going on with, with well, Saint? Well, we're saying what's, what's, what's happening is actually we're we're doing a, a tour, um, another run actually with Wasp. And yeah, I did Wasp. another yeah. tour with them. We just did a tour with them um, last year, and uh, now we're going to do another one. And um, it's going to be great. And you know, it was, we had a lot of fun going out there on the road with Blackie and and uh, the guys of Wasp, and, and it's a great tour. So we're going to do another one, and that's like kind of the focus right now. Of what we're doing, um, and uh, let's see what else. Um, music, music. Um, well, I mean, we kind of started writing some songs with Armin Saint a little bit. Uh, Joey Brown and myself, uh, we are kind of like the catalyst to get the song on going. Um, we kind of move slow, very slow. Um, you know, but usually, I say it's quality over quantity. So even though there's not a lot of Armin Saint records, they're all great. But, um, true story. But in any case, um, so we should, but I mean, Tracy, who's Joey's wife, who's the president of, of Metal Blade, and is an amazing person, um, has kind of tried to get his kick in the ass to like hurry up a little bit. And uh, I am going to be turning 60 next month. So it's like, I mean, time is not on my side. It's not on my side. I'll be 66 in two weeks. <laughs> Give me one more sex and I'll be the devil. <laughs> <laughs> and, then Brian, and then Brian, going forward with Metal Blade, obviously you're still signing bands, lots of uh, great newer bands that, that you could mention right now. Obviously, Job for a Cowboy. Making stab, wounds. stab wounds! 200 stab wounds! Yes. Yeah, that's, that that's, that's in yeah. hell. That's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff over there. Yeah, I mentioned the Aston Hill thing, which is really cool. Va Vomitory. Yeah. That's yeah. Oh, there's a lot of good stuff. I mean, there's a ton of good bands. Like I mentioned, this Vistadoc before. You know, it's, it's really great. We've got a couple of newer bands. Uh, Capra is a really cool band. It's, it's doing a bunch of stuff. Uh, yeah, Twitch Dab Wounds is the one that, that I'm super psyched about. There, uh, I saw the Psycho Fest uh, in Vegas last summer, and like I like I love going to shows and I love seeing bands. But I've seen I don't know. Somebody asked me how many shows I've seen. I, I estimate it to be somewhere around 6,000 wow. in my yes. life. Yeah, it's pretty much just Iron Maiden. Yeah. I don't think they even played that show. Um, but they just blew me away, and they're really cool. They're kind of a, if you haven't heard them, they're like a cross between, and they're young kids, and they're really good. They're kind of like, to me, they remind me of like a cross between Cannibal Corpse and Power Trip. 
because they've got the, the death metal thing, but there's a lot of thrash in there. It's they're really, really good. But there's a lot of really cool bands out there. Uh, Ingested. I mean, there, you know, there's a lot of good stuff. Just go to metalblade.com and listen to all of them. <laughs> and I love that when they asked the, one of the guys from 200 Stab Wounds about the name, and he said, well, you know, 100 wasn't enough, <laughs> and 300 was too much. So. <laughs> They sell about 200 stab wounds, and I, and I love that band. Yeah. Uh, and I'm glad that you signed them, and I do love Vomitory. Uh, but obviously, again, and Brian alluded to this earlier, sort of what, whatever your style is, and you're all here because you do like the music on here, Brian signs what he likes. So you, you're always going to find a great variety of stuff. And like you said, go to MetalBlade.com. Um, any last questions before we wrap things up? Right down here. Have to ask, uh, what's the status on the documentary, which is awesome? Oh, yeah. Saw it down the street. Armin Saint documentary. I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm All right. Thanks, anyway. You had a premiere, John. I, I know we did, but I, I know that uh, the the guy who put the film together, Russell, is is just trying to get some. It showed at a few different um, film festivals, and he's just trying to get some distribution. And it is really cool. It's it's great. And Brian is in there a lot talking about saying and a lot of various uh, people from from our walk of life and do the years in the business. And it, it is really good. So um, hopefully one day it'll come out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you have one more. I think Neil. Yeah, one, one more. One more, Neil. Yeah, I, I just want to say that I love Betsy, and I would ask her a question if I could think of one quick. But I got one for John, kind of a split in half one for John just say and for you Brian. Just me was enough. Yeah. Well, so... You so had for, me at... So for, for Brian, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, between For the Sake of Heaviness and Swing of the Blade, the impetus or the key differentiators between, you know, what, you know, drove you to write, write a second book and kind of the purpose of that versus, you know, the difference between the first and second book. And yeah, so the, the second book, I, I talked about it earlier, it just, you know, there was such a great response to the first book, which, again, just is very humbling and kind of blew me away. And just a lot of people said, you know, why don't you do a second book? And I was like, well, I don't like that. And then it kind of just, everyone wanted more stories about, you know, some of the bigger bands, and they also wanted more stories about the obscure bands. So it kind of led to, like, well, I was talking to my co-writer, Mark Eglinton, who's, who's phenomenal and does a great job. And he was saying, yeah, let's, let, we should definitely do something. So we just started... Same process as the first one. It's a little bit different because the first one is basically a chronological order of the history of the label. This one is more just more in depth about you know the, the Mont Martin and Armored Saint and King Diamond and you know all those sort of bands and then a lot of stuff about newer bands, uh, a lot of stuff about more obscure bands. There's some very boring nonsense about the the music industry that people seem to like to ask me about. So so it's just kind of a, a overall thing like. A, this, the title is, you know, more stories from Metal Blade. That kind of sums it up, I guess. Thank you. And then, right. and then the one for John. Oh, oh, okay. oh, yeah, one for John. One A, one B. One, one, yeah. So real quick. So John, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask. Uh, you know, I, 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 my question was going to be about writing mat new material for the, you know, the next album, but I, you already answered that. But I do want to ask you, as far as the tour that's coming up with Wasp, do you think uh, with Blackie's, uh, you know, health? Situation if his back's going to be okay because I know he's uh, up for surgery and we wish him well. But I just wanted to well, see, you know, see what the temperature I, we, is. I think uh, we certainly hope so. Of course, you know, um, we we want him to do the whole tour and then, and I think the last five shows in Europe he had to actually sit in a seat, yeah. um, but still pull it off. And kudos to him for that. But um, yeah, I mean, I think you know, Wasp is they had a great European tour um, and real successful and. Uh, I was kind of one of the people who was pushing to do another leg because I was like, Doug, we can do another 30 cities that we didn't even do. And um, of course, we're doubling up a couple, one being LA, of course, Thanks. but um, and, and Philly or something, but in New York. But in any case, um, I'm hoping he's going to be fine and uh, he's blacky. He'll be all right. All right. Okay. All right. Hey, everybody, have a nice hand for Betsy Pitts. John Pitts. you how to get on the line and uh, this man right here will sign wow. your book and thanks again. <laughs>